so I will be talking uh, about the single screen cinemas, uh, principally of uh, Bombay, uh, called Mumbai since 1995. But film has a long and complex history in India, beginning in 1896, when the films of the Lumiere brothers, cinema pioneers, were exhibited at Watson's Hotel in Bombay, as I said, now known as Mumbai. Located in the south portion of Bombay, which was the center of British imperial power, Watson's hotels catered to a select audience of Europeans. But Indian audiences were soon watching the Lumiere films that were short documentaries of modern life and work too. Only a few years later, Indians were also making their own films. One of the first was an 1899 documentary of wrestlers in Bombay's famed Hanging Gardens. And the pioneering Indian filmmaker, D.S. Falke, who was a staunch Indian nationalist, screened his uh, Harish Chandra Raj, the first feature-length Indian film, to a Bombay audience in 1913. Shah Partly in Bombay, it drew on the story of a legendary Hindu king from a Sanskrit literary epic. This film initiated the still vibrant genre of mythological films in India, and it planted the seeds for a Hindustani film industry, that is, films in Hindu, that would be based in Bombay. And that's why... Um, we now speak of Bollywood films, commercial Hindi cinema, which is a conflation of Bombay with Hollywood. Film making and film going soon spread to other Indian cities like Calcutta, Madras, and Lahore. And today, Indian films are made in Hindi, Telugu, um, Tamil, Bengali, and 16 other Indian languages. There are more films made in India than any other country in the world. Uh, in 2019, there were 1,700 films released in India, more than double Hollywood's output of 792 films in that same year. And more than 1 billion Indians bought movie tickets in that year too. Today, Indian audiences have returned to their cinema halls in far greater numbers than anywhere else in the world. Uh, with the waning of the pandemic. And box office receipts there are on track to surpass those collected before the pandemic. Despite the great number of films produced and consumed in India, it is still the most underscreened film market in the world, with only seven screens per one million people. It's a staggering figure. As in the rest of the world, single screen cinemas in India have been closing at an alarming rate since the 1970s. And this is the Capitol Theater, which had been closed for many, many years. It's now uh, supported principally by the offices and the shops and restaurants that are located there. Occasionally, uh, films are shot. It's a magnificent theater. It was once called the Gaiety. It was a live performance venue for ballet and opera and theater. And then in 1928, it was converted into the cinema and renamed the Capitol. Single screen cinemas lost audiences to television and VHS tapes in the 1970s, and then to DVDs and multiplexes in the 1990s, and now to digital streaming platforms since 2008. There were reportedly 24,000 single screen cinemas in India during the 1990s. In the wake of the pandemic, there are now only 6,200. With their disappearance, a rich modern architectural heritage found in India's metropoles, small towns and neighborhoods will be lost. But equally important is the intangible heritage that will vanish. It's a heritage that's created by Indian film goers inside and around the single screen cinemas. This heritage is paradoxically inclusive yet segregated, conservative yet transgressive, and joyful yet violent. And here I'm reminded of what the French theorist Roland Barthes um, stated. 
that whenever I hear the word cinema, I can't help thinking hall rather than film. So that's become my mantra. Bartha wrote about the cinema hall enveloping him, the lone male viewer, into the darkness of reverie and diffused eroticism. This is very different from the film going experience in India where people engage with each other and with the city beyond the cinema halls. Focusing on the single screens of Bombay and now Mumbai, I will explore their tangible and intangible histories and strategies already adopted, as well as others to ensure that their past have a future. Now, this is a very personal story for me. My friend Vani Subramaniam, whom you see here with our cinematographer Pooja Sharma, uh, we began working on a documentary film about India's single screen cinemas more than a decade ago. Vani is not only a very gifted documentary filmmaker, but she's an activist and feminist as well. Vani and I, when we began this project, weren't really sure what stories we wanted to tell about single screens with our film. But we knew that we didn't want to narrate more nostalgic and uh, melancholy stories of their passing. We met Nazir Hussain. Whoops, let me go back. We met Nazir Hussain, whom you see here, and Salim Bitu um, Amadala. They are remarkable owners of picture palaces in Mumbai, but they are also historians, curators, and preservationists of all things Bombay. And from them, we learned about stories of hope and renewal for single screen cinemas. They generously shared their knowledge and time with Ivani and me again and again, as they have with so many others. Because of the respect and esteem they are held in by their fellow theater owners, they open the doors of cinemas across India to us and our film crew. Uh, now, um, Mr. Amadala's Regal Cinema and Mr. Hussein's Liberty Cinema are among the crown jewels of Indian Art Deco architecture from the 1930s and 1940s. It fused Indian traditions of ornament, materiality, and handicraft with modern materials, structures, and technologies of the Jazz Age Deco of the 1920s and Streamline Deco of the 1930s and 40s. Art Deco also gave the first generation of India's professionally trained architects their initial experiences with modern concrete and steel frame construction and modern technologies of sound, illumination, and air conditioning. After Miami Beach, Mumbai has the largest collection of Art Deco buildings in the world, and it includes offices, bungalows, schools, apartments, skyscrapers, and public institutions, as well as cinemas. UNESCO designated the Victorian Gothic buildings of the British Raj and the Art Deco buildings of Indians, a World Heritage Site, in 2018. And these two architectural stands square off against each other. Here we have, whoops, sorry, I need to do that. <laughs> Where's my pointer? Okay, there. Um, they face off uh, against this wonderful open green space, the Oval Maidan in uh, Mumbai. Here are the Art Deco buildings and anchoring them, can't see it very well in this view from the 1930s, is the Eros Cinema, which was built in 1938, again, by an Indian architect. And then on the other side, we have the institutions, the high court, the university associated with the high Victorian Gothic of the British Raj. Um, it is really quite remarkable um, that Mumbai uh, won this designation for its Victorian and Art Deco buildings because there are very few modern UNESCO heritage sites. This designation is also important because Art Deco is still stigmatized by many curators and historians of modernism as what I call, quote, the girly modernism. That means it's too polychromatic, too decorative, and too popular. Now, um, I would like uh, for you to listen to Nazir Hussain, the owner of the Liberty Cinema, uh, as he narrates its history and also its future. And again, this is an excerpt from our still in process documentary film, uh, Shifting Frames. So we'll hopefully hear from Nazir. Mm. 
the area in Bombay, Pune, Loud? Nasik, Devlali, which is like a triangle. This was a major Allied base. And my late father, his name is Habib, his name was Habib Hussain, was building cinema after cinema, catering to the entertainment of the troops that were here. They were mainly English speaking, so the cinema shown was English. And some were in tents, some were proper structures, but the total was 45. You had a projector, you had a screen, and you had the box that was the speaker. And that was it. So he found himself with 45 of them, and he couldn't control it. It was always a cash business. The man paid for the ticket, entered the premises and saw the film. So he came to the conclusion it would be far better for him to consolidate. It's too darn hot. It's too darn hot. And the consolidation took place as the Liberty Cinema. By the end of World War II, every cinema in South Bombay was screening English product. It may have been from Hollywood, it may have been from Britain, wherever, but the language was English. By that time, there was a crying need for, a, for an outstanding cinema to show Hindi pictures, Hindustani pictures. And Liberty filled that void magnificently. It was called the Liberty Cinema because we started in 47. India got its independence at that time and that name didn't take too long to establish. The formal opening was a film of Mahbub Khan called Andaz. And the curtain opened sideways in those days. The screen was small. Now it's vertical because the screen is as big as it can get. As there were ribbons tied across, I cut one of the two ribbons and a young daughter of Moti Chand who built this cinema cut the other end. There were no ministers and all the rest of that. The Bombay Hospital, which is next to us, they used to complain that, you know, our premiers would be very noisy, but uh, they used to have strikes, far more noisy than our premiers. They said it would be a good idea if the cinema moved. And my father was telling me they think we're on wheels or something like that. Okay, so that's Nazir narrating the history of the liberty. And now we're going to see a clip of its present, but also how he projected into the future by repurposing and reimagining it. It may surprise you, but um, the biggest run we had was much later in the 90s and the film was Hum Aapke Hai Kon. The Barjatia family that made the product said we love your cinema, we've got this picture and we're prepared to make this the main cinema provided you change the sound system. So that sounds fair. My sound system change is going to cost me 10 lakhs of rupees and what do I do if your picture bombs? And they said, we'll buy the equipment from you for the price you paid for it. And that was a handshake. It was never a contract. And there was no looking back. We ran full for 44 weeks. Our most famous patron was M.F. Hussain. He fell in love with Madhuri Dixit on the screen. 
He came and saw it 50 times. And when the music came on the screen, he would start dancing and everybody would start screaming. And it was part of the fun and game. Mr. Hussein's ambitions, the father of uh, Hussein, Habib, for the liberty were outlined in a souvenir pamphlet that accompanied the cinema's opening in 1949. Here he wrote, quote, it is a statement to the Indian people that no theater can be too good for them or for Indian pictures. To the Indian picture goer who complained that the finest facilities were being used to show foreign products, the liberty comes as a promise of a brighter future in the shape of an ultra-modern, air-conditioned, luxury cinema dedicated to showing the best of Indian films, end quote. Teak and ebony were imported for the Liberty's interiors from Burma and white cedar from Canada. Habib Hussein also specified an advanced sound system from Germany and a carrier air conditioning system from upstate New York. W.M. Namjoshi, the interior designer, used colored incandescent light bulbs to create a light show, as you saw in the clip from the film. Placed behind plaster ornaments, they changed the light from ivory to yellow and then pink to red. It was a spectacle rivaling those projected on the Liberty screen. Um, and I just had to show you this photograph of a young Nazir Hussein being helped by his father Habib to cut the ribbons at the opening of the Liberty Cinema in 49. Um, and again, um, Nazir uh, realized that he had to reposition the Liberty um, because of the competing media platforms. So interestingly enough, he returned to the idea of live performance. So he extended the stage by taking out several rows of seats and he also constructed a, a green room and dressing rooms for the performers uh, as well. I just wanted to should go through. I remember I was walking past the Liberty one night to my hotel and the marquee was illuminated with Liberty Cinemas available for concerts, film festivals, plays, annual general meetings of shareholders and other events. And you can see the dark claws that were draped over its entrances. That's because a film shoot was going on. If you go on YouTube, you can see it featured very prominently in music videos. It's also in television shows and in movies uh, as well. Uh, the Liberty was only the beginning of W.M. Namjosi's performative um, cinema architecture. Oh, no, Chris, sorry. No, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just wanted to show you again because it went by sort of quickly in the film clip. Again, we're very excited to have Christopher Nolan there uh, through the auspices of the Film Heritage Foundation, which was established in 2014 to preserve India's cinematic heritage. Over 90% of early Indian silent films have been lost, um, and they have attracted international support uh, and financial undertaking and they're training film archivists and conservationists. So it's very important, the work that they're doing. And it was very appropriate that they launched this initiative in the Liberty Cinema. Um, in 2015, Nazir, who was a motor sportsman, a Formula One racing driver, was very uh, happy to host an automotive royalty symposium and exhibit uh, at the Liberty where uh, the Rolls Royces and other fine cars of the Maharajas um, were exhibited in the courtyard of the Liberty and Nazir and others took part in a symposia. And then this wonderful uh, performance of um, live music with the films of Fearless Nadia, who was an early female action hero in um, 
Bombay cinema. And it was very appropriate that the violinist was suspended from the ceiling and, and rotating in homage to her acrobatic feats uh, as well. So these were the kind of events uh, that Nazir Hussein, who sadly passed away in 2019, envisioned for the Liberty. He did tell me he didn't want to have any more rock concerts in the Liberty because after one of them, uh, he noticed that the plaster um, in the ceiling had been loosened by the high decibels. And I think he also complained because his family penthouse was atop the Liberty Cinema. So I think he heard some sound and vibration uh, as well. As I said, the Liberty was only the beginning of W.M. Namjoshi's performative cinematic architecture. According to Hemant um, Chaturvedi, who is a cinematographer and now photographing India's single screen cinemas. Um, Hemant has been doing this since 2019. He has photographed some 950 cinemas across India in 800 cities, towns, and small villages. Uh, before Hemant, we knew very little about Nam Josi, uh, um, but he is piecing together a history from interviews with cinema owners and managers. And he also tracked down Nam Josi's brother, who's a designer too, and his granddaughter, an architect. As shown in Himant's photographs, uh, the Raj Mandir in Jaipur is clearly Nam Josi's masterpiece. Uh, so the liberty is the beginning and the Raj Mandir is the culmination of his prowess. Um, here, not only as an interior designer and furniture maker, but also as an architect. Another one of uh, um, him on incredibly stunning photographs. Um, he paid homage to the Sarana family who founded the Raj Mandir, but they had originally come to Jaipur in the 18th century as jewelers to the royal family. So you can see that in this beveled and etched glass, um, chandeliers, the other lighting fixtures, again, the backlit plaster reliefs, um, it's really cast in the colors of gemstones, emeralds, sapphires, diamonds, uh, and rubies. And it changes in the lobby. So people come early, they buy their tickets early to again, experience, photograph, have themselves photograph in this performative architecture. And it continues on in the interior of the theater that also morphs um, as it did at the Liberty, but here in a much more spectacular fashion from a variety of colors. Um, and um, the 90 year old Mr. Serana, uh, whom Hemant interviewed, said that he believed more people came for the architecture than actually to see the films. And it is very much a tourist attraction as well too. Um, just as an aside, I would hope that um, Hemant's uh, photographs and also uh, the research he's doing uh, into the architects, but also the projectionists, the sign painters uh, for these single screen cinemas might find a venue, uh, not only in India, but here in the United States. And here I'll just plant a seed, since this is a humanities center, that Rochester might be a very apt venue for his uh, photography and work, given that the Eastman House now has the largest collection of Indian cinema since 1990 world, uh, 1991 in the world. Now, Indian audience members become performers in this performative architecture, creating a participatory cinema in picture palaces, as well as more modest neighborhood cinema halls. They engage with the spectacle on the screen, reinventing themselves in the process. Young men seated in the stalls, which are the cheapest seats closest to the screen, are the chief and have been the chief performers. To signal their approval of a film, they cheered, whistled, and threw coins and popcorn. They sang along with the actors from songbooks that they had purchased outside the theater, or they learned the lyrics from the songs by repeated viewings of the film, like M.F. Hussein, there 50 times. They also might dance in the aisles, as he did at the Liberty. Now, what I want to do is to show you a Bollywood recreation of this participatory cinema from this 20... 
2007 film, Om Shanti Om, that uh, stars the evergreen Bollywood hero, Shah Rukh Khan. He plays a junior artiste who's basically an extra uh, in Bollywood films. He's enamored of his leading, leading lady here, and he manages to sneak into the premiere uh, of her film. And he begins to project himself into the screen and also into the spaces of the cinema. Now, Larry's promised me he might get up and dance too, inspired by Shah Rukh. सजना से काहे आए लाज सजनी झूने दे अंग मोहे आज सजनी okay. so now we'll see what happens in the cinema itself see the acting is not subtle it very much draws on the traditions of silent film where everything had to be conveyed visually and bodily in real cinema halls even the more decorous audience of women children and families seated in the more expensive dress circle balcony and box seats might join in the singing if not the dancing erupting in the stalls below and that might be a bit exaggerated in om shanti om but i have seen that kind of dancing take place in indian cinema thus an inclusive community was and is momentarily created but one still segregated by class caste religion gender and ethnicity City, all determined by the price of the seat. Nevertheless, cinema halls were one of the few public spaces where Indians divided by so many differences could come together under one roof. Film's arrival and rise in India coincided with the struggle for independence, and British colonial authorities grew increasingly concerned by the excitement and energy films generated, especially among young working class men. And you see these young men gathered in front of the Bharat Mata Cinema in Bombay in their Gandhi hats and their probably hand loom uh, kurtas, which are all telling signs of um, those patriots who were involved in the independence struggle. The cinema is also decorated here. It must have been a holiday or a religious festival when huge crowds turned out to the cinemas and the studios timed their most important releases to those holiday schedules um, as well. Fights would sometimes break out amongst the young 
um, male fans of different actors. They formed fan clubs that would compete with one another. Mythological films with tales of Indian kings and divinities triumphing over their enemies and films of modern day Indian life um, that engage with social reform also troubled the British authorities. So in 1918, they established a censorship board to quote, prohibit the screening of any film harmful to morality, public order, or national order. And that censorship board still exists today in an independent India. As historian Lawrence Liang writes, censorship in India had its origins not in film production, the studios, but in the anxieties around the new space that cinema halls created. Single screen cinemas like the Super Plaza and Palace Talkies in Bombay thrived because of the patrons they drew from the central Bombay textile mills. Established by Indian entrepreneurs in the 1850s, the textile mills transform Bombay into a modern industrial economy. Known as the Manchester of the East with its mills as cathedrals of cotton, Bombay had 206 mills employing two thirds of the Bombay labor force by 1911. Militant trade unions recruited members from the impoverished men and women who migrated from India's villages to seek a better life in Bombay. Adjacent to the mills were chawls, and these are chawls here. Uh, they were tenement housing built around courtyards where workers crowded into single rooms, sleeping in shifts. Since the mills ran 24 hours a day, the nearby single screen cinemas timed their showings to coincide with the workers' day and night shift endings. The mill workers invested their wealth not only in the film studios, but also in the single screen cinemas, like the Bharatmata cinema that you saw in the previous photograph. It was actually built on the grounds of the India United Textile Mills in 1939, and its very name, which means Mother India, alludes to the importance of textiles to the Indian independence movement. Indian nationalists led boycotts of imported English textiles, and Indian patrons wore Indian hand-loomed or manufactured cloth, thus identifying themselves as new citizens struggling for an independent India. The Bharat Mata cinema has always shown films in the language of Marathi, and that is spoken by mill workers who were either born in Bombay or Maharashtra, the state that Bombay became a part of after independence. Um, the Shiv Sinha, a right-wing Hindu fundamentalist party, gained political power in 1995 by claiming migrants and Muslims from outside Maharashtra stalled the work and homes of Marathi speakers who were the true sons of the soil. The Shiv Sinha stoked then and still today nativist and sectarian resentment and violence against migrants and Muslims. And what I'd like to do now is to show you two clips from this wonderful documentary made about this cinema by students um, at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences Media and Cultural Studies program. And we're first going to see an interview with the manager of uh, the Bharatmata um, cinema, Mr. Bopatkar. This whole place where Bharat Mata stands today was originally a recreation ground for the mill workers and the mill superintendents. Films was the new thing. So they decided to build a theatre. So they built a theatre, which was then known as Lakshmi Talkies. Okay. After building the theatre, they realised that they couldn't, they didn't know how to run a theatre. They didn't know where to get the films from. And that is where uh, my grandfather stepped in. My grandfather was distributing a film called Waha, a silent film in Madhya Pradesh, Jabalpur. And the film was not doing well. So that guy had an idea. He had a friend who had a small airplane. They got into that plane, okay, and they flew over Jabalpur and on the market day they distributed thousands of pamphlets. So you had these people, you know, suddenly in Jabalpur, all those pamphlets 
coming down from uh, you know nowhere from heaven it seems and they thought yeah it, it is, it's great the movie has to be great and that is how he caught the attention of all the, uh, the original builders and the architects of this theater and they gave them this theater to run okay now i'm going to give you a sense of what the film going experience is like there in this clip Despite the Shiv Sinha's claims that Mumbai's economic woes were due to migrants and Muslims, the real problems centered around the dying of the textile industries, just as the single screen cinemas were dying. Protesting uh, the mill owners' desire to cut labor costs by introducing modern power looms, 100,000 textile workers in Mumbai went on strike from 1982 until 1983. It is and was the longest union strike in history. However, the mill owners broke the unions and they were militant um, unions organized by the Communist Party in Mumbai. They closed their Bombay mills and built factories with the modern power looms in the countrysides with a, a far smaller and more docile labor force. Then a struggle over the future of the 600 acres of land in central Mumbai that the Moribund mills occupied erupted. The trade unions advanced plans to use that land for improved housing, job training centers, and open spaces for their now unemployed uh, mill workers and their families. Architect Charles Correa presided over a commission that proposed using the lands for public housing, open space, and private development. It would be divided into thirds. Despite protracted public protests and legal actions, the mill owners eventually won complete control over the mill lands. With the easing of government controls over the Indian economy in 1991, private investors and developers from India and abroad saw a real estate bonanza in the mill lands. Architectures of neoliberalism and globalization, that is shopping centers with multiplexes, corporate offices, luxury hotels, and gated residential compounds rose on the vacant mill lands or amongst the dying mills. Adding insult to injury, as you can see in um, this promotional um, advertisement, these buildings called by one wag weapons of mass construction even took the names of the once great mills, like the great Eastern mills. This is one of the few uh, remaining mills. Again, it's in the same mill compound as the Baradmata cinema. Um, and uh, one of its sister mills is now being converted into a museum, which I'll speak about um, Anon. Um, 
already buffeted by competing media platforms, single screen cinemas like the Palace Talkies, Super Plaza and Bharat Mata struggled to survive along with their now immiserated working class patrons. Unable to get plum Bollywood films from distributors because of his dwindling audiences, Sharad Doshi, owner of the Palace Talkies and Super Plaza began screening films in Bhojpuri. That is the language of these migrant workers from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, like Mohammed Javir and um, Farid Sheikh. These are young men who still come from India's villages to find work now in the light manufacturing, the service sector, and of course, construction industries of Mumbai. And now I want to show you a clip from um, the film Vani and I are making interviewing Javir and Farid. मेरा घर उत्तर प्रदेश भरोही में ही है कारपेट सिटी फेमस है क्योंकि माँ बाप थोड़ा काफी परिस्थिति डाउन थी तो हमको ऐसा लगता था कि हम अगर जॉब करें तो घर का सपोर्ट कर सकते हैं तो चलते हैं मुंबई ये वो थोड़ी लंबी कहानी है एक्चुअली कुछ ऐसा लाइफ में मोड आया कि एक फाइट हो गई तो गांव छोड़ के भाग गया मुंबई फिर यहाँ पर आने के बाद जॉब के तलाश में बहुत दौड़ा अपने को सक्सेस नहीं हुआ क्योंकि मैंने अपने सारे सर्टिफिकेट वगैरह सब कुछ घर पे ही छोड़ के आया था अभी तो गांव चले जाओ ना तो फिर वहाँ पे दस दिन पंद्रह दिन के बाद ये होता है कि पहुँचो मुंबई बहुत अच्छा लगता है सबसे पहले मैं मुंबई में आया मैं आपसे क्या बताऊँ मुझे रोना आता था बहुत I thought that I would go to the house and see the people of the house. Mumbai is very dangerous. I was able to meet them, but then Mumbai is my Mumbai. Here I get a little peace. This is the air. And there is no more air here. It's a good peace. 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 तो वहाँ पे नदी रहती थी अभी यहाँ पे समंदर है तो काफी और एक्चुअली एक्चुअली क्या है यहाँ पे फिल्में का कुछ ज़्यादा ही सीन रहते हैं तो अभी देखने को तो यार यहाँ तो यहाँ हुआ था अभी चलके हम भी वहाँ फोटो क्लिक करते हैं क्या बात लड़की या दोस्त लड़की अभी जस्ट देखिए वांटेड का सीन नीचे बहुत सारे हुए हैं और अभी एक दो फिल्म आए थे उसके में भी नीचे जो डेड बॉडी को जलाते हैं सब तो ये है अंधेरी का पोस्ट ऑफिस तुमने तो कहा था तुम यहाँ नहीं हो ना यू नो यहाँ पे वो बैठा था तो क्लिक किया वहाँ पे वो हुआ था आओ यहाँ पे क्लिक बस इसके वजह से थोड़ा और चलो वहीं चलते अच्छा लगता है फोटो का शौक इनको ही ज़्यादा है मुझको इतना नहीं है मैं तो बस ये खींचने का शौक इनका है खींचने का शौक नहीं नहीं ये जबरदस्ती हाँ भाई निकालना है भाई निकालना है Javier has uh, aspirations to become a film star, if uh, perhaps in Bhojpuri films or even Bollywood films. Uh, he was working in a bakery when we shot that sequence. He went to a gym in order to build his body up. He did find some jobs as security on film shoots. He kept thinking that Vani, as an independent filmmaker, was going to be able to facilitate uh, his career in Bollywood. And I'll just, this last photograph, it's a very Shah Rukh Khan pose. Uh, so again, he's emulating uh, both the Bhojpuri film stars, but also the Bollywood film stars uh, whom he admires. Because of screening Bhojpuri films, the Palace and Super Plaza began to book uh, full houses after struggling for so many years. Tickets there would cost 50 to 75 cents US compared to the five to Twelve dollar tickets of the picture palaces and multiplex, which are completely unaffordable for these young migrant men. Sharad Doshi uh, repainted. Whoops. Oh, anyway, sorry, I don't know why that's there. 
Yeah. Um, though she was able to repaint and replaster his cinemas, he replaced the fans with air conditioning and he improved the quality of the canteen snacks served in the two cinemas. But both Pori films and their audiences are targets for the Shiv Sena's vandalism and violence. The owner Doshi continued showing these films because they were so profitable, but he has had to shut the cinemas down when anti-migrant and anti-Muslim tensions mounted. In the wake of the pandemic, measures uh, long called for by the cinema owners are urgently needed to prevent more single screen cinema closures. So let me go back to this. I've gotten out of sync, I apologize. Government entertainment taxes that account for as much as 48% of a ticket's price in Mumbai leave precious little for the single screens from their inexpensive tickets. Since these taxes support the film industry, why can't they also help struggling heritage single screen cinemas? Reduce property taxes, which have soared in Mumbai since the liberalization of the Indian economy in 1991, and also reduced electricity costs would also help these cinemas. Mumbai drafted the first municipal heritage regulations in um, 1996 that became a model for other Indian cities. And it also pioneered public-private partnerships to restore heritage structures. Could such a public-private partnership be used to preserve and upgrade heritage single-screen cinemas? The Mumbai municipality is now repurposing um, an Indian United Textile Mill that I discussed earlier, one of the only mills left, as a city museum for textile art and design. As part of this mill compound, the Bharatmata cinema could be restored and upgraded to narrate the stories of the Marathi textile workers and their families and their cultures of film, poetry, and theater in conjunction with the museum's exhibitions and programs. Can streaming services like Netflix and the Hollywood partners like Disney of India Studios contribute funds to preserve and find new purposes for India's single screens. Netflix has already done this at the Paris Theater, an iconic modern cinema in Manhattan, and the city's only surviving single screen. In 2019, Netflix leased the Paris to premiere its films, um, and also to organize revival programs for Netflix directors. They and other corporates could support Indian single screen cinemas through India's mandatory Corporate Social Responsibility Act. And India was the first country in the world to pass such an act. The provisions of the Corporate Social Responsibility Act allow corporates to invest profits in education, gender equality, healthcare, and now heritage. India's metropoles, secondary cities, small towns, and villages are all starved for green social, educational, and just pastime spaces. And such spaces need to be accessible to all Indians, especially to young Muslim and migrant men who are demonized and heavy, heavily policed in public spaces. Corporate social responsibility funds could also create such spaces for working class audience at cinemas like the Super Plaza. It's tree canopies, courtyards, and verandas like those of the Palace Talkies and Bharat Amata cinemas provide relief from the crowds, noise, heat, and dust of the city. It's why film goers, as you see here at the Super Plaza, come early and linger as long as they can there. These Working class cinemas also have, as I said, very spacious courtyards and verandas, which you see here, which could be repurposed uh, for these pop-up purposes. And they could also generate revenues as wedding halls and other social spaces. As Brenda Samaya, whom uh, Robin mentioned, she's a Mumbai architect, planner, preservationist, and community activist once observed, observed about her own buildings, like uh, the Jubilee Church, um, the uses of a building, quote, take ownership of a building, not always in alignment with the original design. Because of India's demanding programs, watertight budgets, heat, dust, and rain. But sometimes they discover, the users, an opportunity I would not have thought of while designing the building. The, thus, what else might a film goer at the Super Plaza or Palace Talkies need and want from these cinemas, apart from simply watching both Pori films in an air-conditioned space? Born in Rochester, New York, thus a local hero, 
Clarence Stein, community architect and builder, included single screen cinemas in new towns like Greenbelt, Maryland, he planned during the New Deal era. And I'll just show you this unlikely photograph of Clarence Stein sitting in the garden of the home of Aileen McMahon, his wife, who was a Hollywood actress. And her films were actually screened in India. We found posters for The Man from Laramie in one of the cinemas that we were filming at. Um, the Greenbelt Cinema, apart from film screenings, um, had other lives as a live performance theater, a church, a social hall, and today, as you can see, a media arts literacy lab. Like parks, schools, and libraries, cinemas were, Clarence Stein wrote, community facilities providing alienated and isolated urban nomads with much needed leisure and sociality. Cinema halls for Stein were fundamentally democratic spaces because they gathered all, despite their differences, as in India, under one roof. Now, Stein was also a consultant for the first master plan drafted for the new capital city of the East Punjab in an independent India, that is Chandigarh. He worked with uh, Albert Mayer and J.H. Whittlesley. This is one of the site plans that they did uh, for a neighborhood block, a residential sector uh, of Chandigarh. And Stein proposed that a neighborhood cinema hall seating about 700 people be built in every one of these residential neighborhoods. So, um, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, this is the area here. Uh, it had markets. Uh, it had uh, a bazaar area, craft workshops. And this is the cinema here, which you see um, with the letter K on it. Um, Indian single screens still struggling to survive are also struggling to realize Clarence Stein's vision for them as institutions of equality in the world's largest democracy. Thank you very much.